Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Amanda K. Gibson. Uh, She's an assistant professor of biology at University of Virginia. And we're going to talk about parasites and uh, how they may drive evolutionary change. Sounds really cool. So, Amanda, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me about your research. What's the premise of it? So, yeah, so broadly, I think of myself as an evolutionary biologist who studies, yeah, infectious diseases, interactions between hosts and their parasites. Hmm. Um, I think ultimately what has unified my work for a long time is an interest in understanding you know, why we see infections or disease in some places or not others or sometimes and not others or some individuals and not others, right? Why why might we see so much disease in one population and not another? Or why might one host get so sick and not another? That, that, that variation, I think, is what broadly unites a lot of the work that we do. Yeah, what amazes me is, uh, you know, amongst parasites, the adaptation and the, mm-hmm. the, the different lifestyles, in, you know, in definitive versus like intermediate hosts, how do they do that? Sure. It's just crazy, you know? Yeah, so a lot of the work that, I mean, there's so many ways of, of kind of tackling these questions about uh, these amazing adaptations or this variation in, in why host or when, why one population might have more of a disease than another. We tend to take an evolutionary perspective or, or which means a lot of things come down to genetics, right? Of like, what are the differences in, say, the genetic makeups of populations or change in the genetics of populations over time that might explain the variation we're interested in? And then I should say, too, I also, so I, I work on a really broad away, array of parasites, and I often, I define parasites in a way that I think not everybody always uses it. So I, I define parasitism as a strategy. So essentially anything that harms its host. And so by that definition, okay. I, would, I would say, like, a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or these really complicated animal parasites that you're referring to. So I would call all of those parasites, <laughs> even though not everyone agrees with that. Um, well, I guess what you're saying is an organism could exhibit parasit- parasitic behavior, but exactly. that may, it may exhibit other kinds of behavior too, cooperation, mutualism, et cetera. So it's not like this organism, that's all it is. It's just a parasite. You know, some sure. of them can do a lot of different things. And also, and then on a similar vein is that it actually unites things that biologically we might think of as very different. So you might think like a tapeworm and a virus, those seem, those seem very, like they're very different categories of organisms, but there are, they have shared strategy that we might be able to use to gain sort of a broad understanding of how those organisms might evolve or their populations would have might evolve. Well, since, since you study a lot of different organisms, you know, what I'll do is I'm going to ask you some questions and let's, you know, bring up specific examples. Like, uh, you know, let's, let's start with this. So what, what's an example of a parasite that appears to unify two disparate parts of biology or biological action? You know, what's an example of one that like is really interesting to you? Hmm. That's a tough question. Um, or it's a good question. Well, well we so could I... pick a, you know, we could pick a few parasites and then just go deep on them. You know, ones that you really sure. like study a lot. Well, one thing I think is interesting that we work on in my lab that I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a lot of answers on at the moment, but so um, broadly in my lab, we've shifted to working, doing work on, on nematodes. So um, roundworms that it's a, it's a big phylum that includes, I like nematodes because they have, well, they're very experimentally tractable and I'm fundamentally an experimentalist, but they also, they exhibit enormous variation in traits that I find really important. So for example, mating system, I've done a lot of work on mating system and nematode, um, nematodes vary both within and between species and their mating, that, the way that they reproduce, asexually or asexually, but they also have a lot of variation in whether or not they're parasites. So there's plenty of nematode taxa that are free living, but then there's also been multiple transitions to being 
either parasitizing animals or parasitizing plants. And so one of the parasites that we work on in my lab is a, um, a nematode that parasitizes plants, um, but it itself also gets a parasite. So this is a nematode that attacks the roots of plants, and then on top of it, it gets a bacterial infection that that's, can be really, really nasty. And so I haven't quite wrapped my head around it, but I'm used to thinking about how hosts evolve in response to their parasites, and I'm used to thinking about how parasites evolve in response to their hosts. And I'm not used to well, thinking about if, how you do both. <laughs> well, if you look at, um, you know, some bacteria, sometimes they'll be infected by phages that give them abilities they don't have, you know, like cholera. Uh -huh. Sometimes they'll be infected by phages that kill them. Sometimes they'll be, you know, they'll take parts of phages and uh, adapt it to themselves to improve their circumstance and gain new abilities. So why can't parasites do the same thing? I mean, they're, you know, they learned how to parasitize their host and gain you know, an advantage by using what the host does to their advantage. But at the same time, that doesn't mean they're immune from being co-opted themselves by, you know, bacteria, by viruses, by other parasites, et cetera. No, certainly it, it doesn't. I mean, I think that's why parasitism is so interesting, right? Is that there's, for every host you can think of, gets, a, gets some sort of parasite or pathogen, however you want to define it. And then on top of that, those themselves might get them. So there's this enormous diversity of organisms that that fall in there. I, I think what I have a harder time thinking about is not that not the surprise necessarily exists, but the as an organism or, a, or say a population subject, these different antagonists, right? How do you how do you cope with so many different pressures? Right? How do you evolve to keep up with a host plant that's probably population that's probably evolving to defend it resistance against you and then you're simultaneously bearing selection from your own parasites it's a lot for evolution to grapple with i think well i you know i've been talking to people about the microbiome for instance mm -hmm. so i imagine myself shrunken down to the size of a bacteria in my gut <laughs> i'd be awash in this uh, this craziness there's biofilms there's phages all over the place there's human viruses i'm trying to get nutrients i need i may be like you know under contract to produce nutrients for other people that i you know cooperate with in my community you know there's the immune system um again i'm under attack i also need to trade and live and proliferate uh i don't know how a bacteria since you know, i guess people think they don't have brains and they're so simple how do they exist in this environment successfully? Mm. So I'd say probably a parasite is, you know, there's definitely some analog there. Like, what is its environment like? If you imagine yourself to be one, what would you literally see and experience? Like, what would be your sensory apparatus? You know, would you, you know, people will hear, see, smell, taste, touch. But as a parasite or a bacteria, are you doing like a lot of chemosensing, pH, pressure? You know, how do you decide, uh, oh, I need this molecule and I'll produce this one in turn and, is there any economics to that? You know, like if I want one sugar molecule, I'll give you three of these like short chain fatty acids in return. And I guess all these questions would like inform you about the circumstance of, you know, one of these small creatures and, and how they operate maybe. Yeah. That's an interesting sort of going back to what you said initially, I think with say bacteria and a microbiome, I think that's a good way of thinking about the problem, right? Is that these are really complex environments, right? And they're not just, I th well, personally, what I think is really interesting, maybe this kind of relates to your second point, is that, you know, it's not just a complex environment in the sense that, like, you know, the temperature might be fluctuating or there might be variable nutrients. It's complex because you're surrounded by other organisms, right, that have their own genomes. Their populations are changing through time and in space. I mean, it's that's, there's this quote by an evolutionary biologist who I'm a big fan of, um, John Thompson, who I think it's something along the lines of much of evolution is co-evolution, right? So much of what organisms actually have to grapple with on a, on a daily basis and much of what they actually experience selection pressure from is from the organisms with which they coexist. I, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Well, um, how much of an organism's experience is this, uh, quote unquote selection pressure versus just the day to day moment to moment interaction with other organisms. Like how much agency is there in a bacteria or in a parasite? Because they've got to make all these complex decisions with ambiguous information continuously. And they do it successfully. 
at least for a time. And a lot of these organisms are very successful for eons. So there must be, you know, uh, a very fair bit of, of decision making, at least on some level. I know I'm anthropomorphizing, but, you know, uh, it just can't be this blind randomness. Otherwise, how could you have this success? No, I think it's certainly, I think it's certainly not. I mean, so a lot of what my past research has focused on is this concept of, of uncertainty, sort of the uncertainty in the environment that, or a certainty, uncertainty in its surroundings and interactions that a host or a parasite might face. So I, I mean, my PhD work was on these snails that live in New Zealand and they have females, two kinds of females. They can either reproduce sexually or asexually. And so much of my PhD work and a lot of other work in evolutionary biology is focused on this question of, well, why would you, why would you have those two strategies, right? What, what's, why bother having, having sex? This is this probably, um, I know I have at least one, one visitor recently was probably talking about a very similar idea. And one of the arguments is that sexual reproduction, because it can produce offspring that are genetically variable, sex is, an, is it essentially an adaptation to uncertainty. Right. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. And to, to certain kinds of uncertainty. And so parasites really come into play here. So that system that I worked on, um, or that that those the snails that I worked on were subject to parasitism by a trematode. So trematodes are cloudy helmets or flatworms. And an example that humans get is schistosomiasis. So schistosomiasis is a trematode that goes from snails to humans and then back to snails. So it's one of these ones like you were referring to before that have an intermediate and definitive host. Well, the snails are their intermediate host. And so the, the snails that I worked on got a trematode that went from snails to ducks and back to snails. And the argument there was that eventually the, the females that reproduce sexually, you know, did better generation to generation because they were producing offspring that were genetically variable and thus less likely to be attacked by rapidly adapting parasites that could Say if you were an, a clonal mom and you made offspring that looked just like you genetically, parasites are going to rapidly adapt to those asexual lineages and take them out. Whereas sexual mom is continually making offspring that look a little bit, or can make offspring that look a little bit different than her genetically. And so it, it, it's a way of, of, of generating and dealing with the uncertainty of parasite adaptation. So I spent yeah, a lot of my PhD doing that work. And then for the many prior years of people who've worked on that particular snail trematode system, there's good evidence that that seems to be going, what's going on, right? That in populations where there's lots of parasites, there's also lots of sex happening. Well, I mean, if you look at organisms, they don't just have um, one system for handling ambiguous information, for handling life. They have multiple. So I would say like any organism that can acquire epigenetic marks and probably parasites can, that's one way of ad adaptation, like active adaptation. And then sex is a uh, planning based future adaptation for your progeny, you know, so they're going to be in an environment likely that's different from your own. And if you exist in an environment that's changing and you're changing because of it epigenetically, at least part of that's going to be passed on to your offspring. And then sexual reproduction versus asexual is probably more likely to be able to accommodate that. So it's just another mechanism, I think, by which life continuously adapts to its environment. Yeah. I mean, on, on one hand, I, I agree with you. I also think it's, it's tough, right? Like one of the problems with understanding sex and why so many organisms have sex is that, I mean, why, why break up a, a good thing, right? If, if you're a mom and you successfully reproduced, you know, or you've achieved, you know, you're, you're a high fitness mom. You've obviously got a combination of loci that work, of genes that work in this environment. Why make a bunch of offspring that look different from, from you? Yeah. Why break up a good thing? Well, maybe that's, that's baked into the equation of sex. You know, you're going to have sex with what you consider visually or, you know, chemically or whatever way to be another successful member of, of the community. You're not going to have sex with like some bum, you know, that's going to make crap children. I'm just Maybe. Totally at the point. <laughs> well, usually, usually, you know, usually. So there's definitely discernment and the organism itself is, you know, they, they're, they're going to have sex, fine. So there's this danger that, yeah, they may produce progeny that aren't fit like them. Um, so I think there's definitely at least some, I mean, we see this in a lot of animals and a lot of creatures. They look for signs of fitness. They may be misguided, but they look for it because... I think they, at some, you know, on some level, they realize like, okay, this has got to be good. I just can't like, you know, have sex with anyone and 
make any progeny, they may not survive. And I think also by virtue of the fact that an available partner is alive and not dead and in a state in which they can have sex and, and you know, continue on is some measure of health. So maybe that's some safety mechanism or backstop to this, this process that's very uncertain and can have a very uncertain outcome, you know? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I mean, there's certainly a prominent hypothesis in animal, particular sort of animal behavior, right? This idea that how do you find good genes in your mate? How do you identify those? There's a hypothesis that is related, but maybe a bit more similar to the, the parasite sex stuff is that you would actually not necessarily look for high fitness, but rather someone who is different than you, immunologically different. So this is one of the hypotheses that relates to, um, so vertebrates have MHC loci that are involved in immune recognition of, of parasites. And so the, it's thought that essentially the more diversity of, of MHC alleles, the major histocompatibility complex, if that's really, really diverse, then you can actually recognize more, a greater repertoire of, of parasites that would make you immunologically better defended because you're able to recognize these enemies. And so there's a hypothesis out there that moms should be under selection to mate with males that have distinct MHC from them, distinct immune genes, so that your offspring actually have a more diverse repertoire or immune repertoire. I think there's mixed support for that idea, but it's a really interesting idea. And it relates to the same it relates to those ideas of, of, of sex, right? Is you, you, it's not just it's it's not just finding mates that are good that are doing well. It's actually that sort of the combination of genes and and are those going to function well in the next parasite environment, the next generation with parasites? Which right, I yeah, I, I, I think, think it makes really it makes total sense what you're saying. I don't know if an organism can you know sense. I mean, okay, so I don't know if they can sense another organism's genes, but they can certainly get an experience of the phenotype created by those genes. Well, there's very famous studies where people tried to figure this out, where they essentially had people with different MHC combinations wear T-shirts and sweat on those T-shirts and then have other people smell them and decide whether or not that would be someone they would want to mate with. That's Uh, interesting. What happened? (laughs) Um... I'm hesitating a little bit because I think the way that that was told for a long time was that, yeah, they, I mean, so this was, they did this with women and and men sort of consuming these, I'm not sure if they were, tech, you know, they were assuming these heterosexual pairings and it wasn't humans. And I think in the initial study, they found support for it. And I'm not sure it's, which is obviously incredibly compelling, right? You're like, oh my gosh, you could you could detect that um, and, it, and it works the way you think that so that women would would be sort of more interested in t-shirts of men that had distinct MHC from them. I think it has not been repeated. So I believe that that hypothesis is on the rocks again, but I don't want to, I need to, I would need to look that up. And obviously it's a really compelling idea. So we're sort of like, it's one of those dangerous scientific ideas that maybe you want to be true. And it's scientifically compelling too. But um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what the status of support for that is. But there is interest in general in, in, in folks trying to understand if there's any sort of link between underlying genotypes and things that might be involved in sensing, like, like, like pheromones that you produce or excretions of some sort. Right. So, you know, different genes and different arrangements would produce certain pheromone mixes versus others. So it's the expression of them, maybe not the underlying genes themselves. Right. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think the mechanism is, would be known. I mean, I think some hypothesize that different underlying immune repertoires could correspond to different microbiomes, which in turn could relate to pheromones and sensing. Um, But this is all highly speculative. (laughs) Uh, well, if we don't speculate, how do we think up good experiments to test stuff? So yeah, <laughs> it's okay. This is all speculation, but it's totally fine. You know, you can feel free to speculate if you'd like. Okay, that's good. how we that's how we get to cool novel ideas. Why not? You know. Yeah, but so I mean, kind of, I guess back to some of my stuff. I mean, part of the reason I this fits into a broader interest I have in sort of what is the role of genetic variation in right to what extent does the sort of genetic diversity we see in populations explain? where we see pyroparasites, how how much impact parasites have. I and mean, this is a big, um, been around this idea for a long time, particularly in agriculture, you know, 
if we plant, say, genetically diverse crop fields of crops, are those going to are those going to do better in the face of disease than if we plant fields that have just a single have just say a single genotype of a crop? Or well, I think so. I mean, if you look at monoculture, if there's a um, a disease or some kind of pathogen that's able to successfully attack that particular plant, and they're all the same, I mean, it's very likely that the disease will be successful, but if they're all different, probably by definition, there's going to be a percentage of the population that's not affected and therefore will survive and continue. So yeah, very, I mean, very if, useful strategy. If you assume some sort of genetic specificity for infection, such that some genotypes do better against a parasite than another, right? Then yeah, that should work. And I mean, indeed, so one thing that we've had been doing in the lab now for a while is a really large meta-analysis of this idea. So actually asking, you know, it's an intuitive idea, yet it seems really, it seems kind of obvious, but is there actually evidence for it? And particularly in agriculture, there really is. There is really, really strong evidence. We see about a 50% reduction in parasitism in, in plots that that have multiple, say even just two cultivars of a crop as opposed to one. So it can be pretty dramatic. Yeah, here's another experiment. So under what conditions, you know, pick a parasite, whatever one you want to pick. It does both asexual and sexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. And you know the conditions under which it does both, at least generally. Mm -hmm. And then you put it in a situation where it has a chance to parasitize a more diverse host versus one that's not diverse. Mm -hmm. Does it tend to favor more sexual reproduction in that circumstance versus asexual? That would probably mean that it needs that in order to be successful or it sees, okay, you know, the, the parasitism of this uh, field of corn wasn't as successful as we wanted it to be. So we're going to turn more to sexual reproduction from here on in, at least in the short term versus asexual. Maybe that's a response from the parasite that uh, you can tease out that way. Do you mean the parasite having sex or not? Yeah, right. A parasite that's oh, capable yeah. of both methods, you know. That's an interesting idea. There's some nice data from... Gosh, I think it's a group in Switzerland that did this with a fungal parasite of a crop plant that I can't remember. Um, but yeah, they showed that actually, I think they suggested that, I think it was in diverse mixtures or something. They did find evidence that of, of increased um, signatures of sexual reproduction in the, in the fungal parasite in the presence of, I think, increased host diversity. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really interesting too, right? That That's the flip side of like, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about how hosts adapt to resist their parasites or or basically population level characteristics that may predict how well host populations do. But parasites also are under a lot of pressure to keep up with their host populations and sex should be a way that they, is a way that they could maintain that genetic variation needed to to evolve in response to these antagonistic hosts. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting, I think it's an interesting idea. Yeah, another example would be is, um, I don't know which kind of parasites are a one parasite, one host infection model, meaning it only takes one parasite to infect a host. And which mm -hmm. parasites need multiple ones, you know, 10, 20, 100,000, you know, in order to get into a host to really successfully infect it. If you take one where it takes dozens, hundreds, or thousands to really have a successful infection, create one population of parasites that appears to be all identical genetically, and then a wild type that may have a lot of natural variation in it, which one's more successful in infection? And that may point to parasites that need to infect en masse like that. They've got to be diverse in order to be more successful to infect. If they were all the same, like just a big asexual population of them, um, mm -hmm. asexually produced, they might be less, uh, less able to infect a host. Yeah, that's interesting. I would argue that that, I mean, I agree with you broadly. I think that that would fundamentally depend upon the genetic composition and diversity of the host population. Because you could imagine, I mean, what if the host that you decided to test that asexual parasite on, that was, you know, a host that that asexual parasite was, those hosts in that population, they were all genetically identical. And the asexual parasites were really good at infecting that one host. Then, I mean, then that, that asexual genotype is going to do awesome. It has like all these different hosts that can infect. Whereas that mixed population that you talked about wouldn't do as well because there's going to be a mixture of parasites in there. And if they can only infect certain hosts, then only the subset that's actually good on that one host genotype would do well. But well, the yeah, there's a lot of ways to slice it. Yeah, the, the minute you have a genetically diverse host population, 
then that genetic diversity in the parasite population becomes kind of a handy thing. I think that context dependence is interesting of like, yeah, when, when is it beneficial to have that? You could also pick uh, an organism that hasn't changed in, you know, like a horseshoe crab in 400 million years and see if it has parasites. And then maybe, you know, that kind of host seems to be really stable. They don't, they haven't really changed much. You know, maybe that's a way to eliminate part of the uncertainty in an experiment like that. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to bring up. I would wonder, and I don't know, maybe someone's looked, but like, so horseshoe crabs haven't changed morphologically, right, in terms of the way they look. But I wonder how much actual, maybe not visible evolution has happened. You know, if we think that a lineage like that has been around for a really long time, potentially been, say, co-evolving with parasites for a really long time, we should see, like, there should have been evidence of, of sort of lots of adaptation to sort of deal with its enemies in these populations over time, even though it's visibly not changing, like more, sort of the way it looks is not changing. So I don't know if anyone has actually ever thought about like, right, how these really quote unquote sort of like living fossil lineages, yeah, what their relationship with their parasites look like. And is there evidence of ongoing adaptation? That would be interesting. Yeah, every time I have these conversations, they start out simple. And I feel like by the end of it, I've given like a whole ton of new work for the person to look at if they so choose, you know. So <laughs> I'm giving you like a like hundred new experiments, you know, if you only had the funding you could do. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. What question, like what big questions do you have that you're trying to figure out? Maybe I can uh, throw in some wild speculation and, and seed a new thought for you or something. Which one to pick? Well, so one thing, well, we're doing a few things in the lab, but I think probably a big thing that's puzzling to me that we haven't actually been able to work on that much, but I think about it a lot is, um, so in spite of everything we've been talking about with parasites and, and sex and genetic variation, there's actually plenty of parasites that are asexual and they do just fine, right? So even though Sure, it seems like on average, so I did this work a long time ago in my PhD where I looked at, I looked at nematodes and I asked is of the parasites or I'm sorry, of the nematodes that have, that are parasites, are they more likely to be, to reproduce sexually than their free living relatives? And that would be support for the idea that something like sex, which we think can maintain genetic variation would be an important mechanism for specifically for parasitic lineages that are locked in these co-evolutionary battles with their hosts. And I, and I found support for that idea overall, right? That, that it did seem that we saw more sex in parasitic lineages than we did in their free living relatives. So these ones that, that these nematodes that are not in lineages that became parasitic. So that was cool. And that made sense to me based on what we've been talking about. What's an example of a parasite that's locked into this, they used to have this co-evolution battle versus one that's more wild, what the, the, the certain parasites that aren't really married to oh, one host no. that can go to different ones, or what do you mean? I am no, so I was just making a broad dissociation between a broad distinction between nematodes that are parasitic. So, for example, like humans get bookworm or ascaris or pinworms, these are all nematodes that live in association with a host. And thus, I'm making a broad assumption that is probably not correct, but I'm saying, okay, if you are a parasitic nematode then you are evolving against a host population that is in turn evolving resistance against you. And thus that's this, what I'm calling this kind of co-evolutionary battle that could really favor parasitic lineages that can maintain genetic variation and thus continually adapt to keep up with their hosts. I see what you mean. Yeah. So so maybe um, parasitism is one of the causes of speciation, either in the host or the parasite too. The co you know, co-evolution may go that far. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. We don't know a lot about, we don't know an enormous amount of speciation in parasites. We do know that there's some some groups where the the evolutionary history of the parasite seems to track with with the host. So there's like hosts that are sort of related, and then their parasites have followed that to some extent. Yeah, and then to what? Yeah, to what extent does say one population of hosts interacting with one population of parasites can that drive sort of evolutionary change so dramatically that you could see something like speciation. There, there, are, There's some suggested evidence that that could be the case. It's certainly true that parasites seem to, yeah, drive adaptation in their hosts and vice versa. Any examples of parasites that uh, become symbionts of their hosts or permanently endogenized, become part of them forever, and are transmitted, you know, they, 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 
the next generation inherits them, either in in that active or inactive form. So are you asking, like, are there examples of parasites that have have essentially become mutualist? Yeah, like they they literally become part of their host. And now they're right, they're mutualistic now and they're even heritable. Yeah, they're they're, married with their host now. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, those are really interesting cases. There's not a lot of clear examples, right? Because these things are sort of in an evolutionary time, but they're, but it's very clear. I think, you know, Rickettsia is an example. So that's a group of bacteria where we find species that we think of as being really pathogenic and then species, that, and they might be one and the same, species that have form really close associations with their hosts and are, and are vertically transmitted. And we would think of as mutualist. So it, there, there does seem to be intra, like evidence, particularly in, yeah, in bacterial endosymbionts that there have been transitions between those two. Well, it's not 100% clear which direction, but it does seem that endosymbionts or mutualist, as you're thinking of them, have evolved from parasites. And that's often a comp- or related to changes in what we would call transmission mode. So going from being horizontally transmitted to becoming vertically transmitted, so passing from mother to offspring. Yeah, so, I mean, viruses have done it, you know, mm-hmm. and they exhibit parasitic behavior quite often. So maybe parasites could. Yeah, I'm familiar with it in viruses and bacteria, and I think the principles are all the same. We haven't seen it. I think you're thinking now of like animal parasites, so sort of eukaryotic organisms. I'm not as familiar with with whether or not there's any evidence of that. There's certainly, I think, some evidence of vertical transmission in some animal parasites. Yeah, interesting. Well, is there vertical transmission in, you know, plant parasites or I guess lichens or a, or a symbiont of a, essentially a, a one type of organism and another, right? Yeah, lichens are sort of a, a duo, like kind of like corals. The organism itself, you know, often we think of there's a host and, an, and a symbiont, but in those cases, they are the unit, right? Because that's because we see the unit as opposed to to seeing the host with something inside of it. Yeah, those are fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Well, very, very, very interesting. I don't know, what, what's uh, anything that you feel like you're getting close to a breakthrough on in terms of understanding or, you know, what's your research look like now? And a few years into the future, what's, what's some of your main focuses from here? Well, we have a lot. Um, one that I was bringing up before is that we study these asexual parasites that have really large host ranges. So we study this plant parasitic nematode that I mentioned before that has can infect plants in over 100 families. So that's a massive, that's a massive host range. And it's much larger than the other species in the genus that are sexual. And so... And this is a broad pattern that we see, not just in my in my species of nematode, but in quite a lot of other organisms like um, scale insects, for example, are, are a good example. So how does something that's asexual and that theoretically lacks mechanisms for maintaining genetic variation over time, how is that so successful? I mean, I'm not getting close to an answer on that, but that's something that that's kind of what's driving one of our research areas. Is, is trying to understand that problem. Okay. Well, very good. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. What's the best way for people to find out more and look at your research and, uh, you know, ask questions or see papers? Where can they go? Um, so we have a website that's the lab has a website called coevolving.org. And that is where we post a lot of news and we have publications there. And then, you know, my, my Google Scholar always has has our publications, but the, the lab website is good because it has news and all that sort of thing. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Amanda, thanks for coming on. Uh, I know I've put you in speculation mode big time, but I think it was a really good call where a lot of interesting ideas came up. So I'm glad you came. and I think it was good. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's interesting talking with you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.